Are you ready to embark on a journey of success? To discover your true potential in the untold stories of careers in life sciences. Welcome to Pathfinder by the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. With your host, Tommy Soares, discover the untold stories of industry scientists and unveil the secrets to excelling in your career. Thank you for joining us once again, and remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Welcome, everybody. My name is Tommy Soares. I am the Director of Scientific Strategy and Relations for the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. And today on Pathfinder, I have the pleasure of welcoming Jennifer Morell, the founder of Uncharted, who works in the space between higher ed and industry, helping facilitate the strategies for partnerships and advisory boards that support higher education in its most pressing challenges. Starting as a dance performance major, <laughs> Jennifer graduated from Butler University with a degree in corporate communications, served as social chairman of her sorority, won an alcohol awareness award, spent a season as a cheerleader. You follow that, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Jennifer's life and career are intertwined in a series of directional changes that she best described as a trail I've used as a machete to hack through. Over the span of her 25-year career, Jennifer has served in multiple industries, including entertainment, sports and fitness, tech, real estate, and economic development. She has climbed ladders and falling off cliffs, only to discover she's driven to solve problems while elevating the people and organizations around her. She also figured out that, cur uh, that curiosity is the start of all great adventures. And Jennifer is the retired vice president of TechPoint, where she spent her time working to grow Indiana's tech ecosystem with a special focus on bridging the gap between industry and and academia. Today, Jennifer continues her bridge building work between higher ed and the workforce as a consultant, keynote speaker, and MC and professional dot connector. She also sent me some fun facts about her, which I'm gonna I'm gonna let you all know <laughs> about. She has driven supercars over 150 miles per hour at the Las Vegas Motor Speedway, oh my gosh, <laughs> uh, has climbed to the top of a mountain in 12 inches of snow, is a nationally certified Pilates teacher, plays golf, but not well. I think I would love to join you for a game of golf because I'm terrible, but I love playing it too. Thank you so much for being on the program, Jennifer, and thank you, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me and let me know a little bit about your background. And my gosh, uh, it sounds like a very exciting, uh, exciting life and exciting career so far. Well, thank you. Um, I don't know about exciting, but certainly what I would call uncharted and um, being so not really having a good map but having a good result at the end. Um, I grew up in Indianapolis actually, which is kind of interesting because you hear a lot of students in the space, like I wanna get out of Indiana, I don't wanna be here, but the stats are somewhere over 90% of people who grow up in Indiana end up coming back. So it's a great place to be, it's a great place to work. There are all kinds of opportunities in all sorts of realms. We have some great, um, actually federally designated tech hubs now and life science hubs. So I think that a lot of people end up finding their way back. And for me, that routed through Orlando as I was really fortunate. Growing up in Indianapolis, I grew up dancing um, yes. at what was, does not exist anymore, the Jordan College Academy of Dance, which was the special instruction division. Literally, we called it SID sometimes, special instruction division of Butler University. Okay. And what it was at that time was a pre-professional dance school. And I started there when I was about 10 years old, was very fortunate to have the only TAP scholarship. 
So I actually have that piece of unique trivia to add to the repertoire as well. And when it came to my college search, I know that my, my parents really wanted me to go to college. Um, my mom didn't finish school. My dad has got a master's degree. Um, so college was always something that was talked about for sure. But I was doing this dance thing and my sister was doing this dance thing. Um, about the same time I was uh, um, ready to head to college, my sister went to New York City full time as a 14 year old on a full merit scholarship to the School of American Ballet, which was a little bit of an eye opener because I got injured. Mm. So what do you do? So you have a lot of effort going behind one sibling that has extraordinary talent. And maybe you have some talent and maybe you could have made it, but what are your options? So I started looking at schools to, to go to for dance and not to diminish being a dance major, but I would tell you if you are a dance performance major, or a musical theater major, pick up a second major because eventually you're going to need it either before, during, or after you're going to need some other sorts of skill sets in your repertoire to make it through. And I will tell you that I have, I have um, a sorority sister who was the longest running Carlotta and fan of the opera on Broadway. And she will tell you that you will need some of those skills along the way <laughs> because you will do some other things. Yeah. So I, I, I eventually, I looked at Towson State in Maryland, Wright State in Ohio, and Butler because I was familiar with it. I had grown up on that campus. I had grown, I'd grown up learning to drive around there, walking for my lunch in Broad Ripple, all kinds of things, and, and had this group of friends that, was, that were from schools all over central Indiana. Um, and at the end of the day, I didn't know what to do, but I knew I needed to go. One, I was injured. I needed to rehab and you, you go to college, right? For whatever comes next. Um, so I thought I would be a dance major. Um, my parents, I remember a dinner they had at our home. And one of my parents' friends was the vice president at Lacey Diversified. If you can search back in your brain way back, there was a, a gentleman who had an acquisitions company. And I just remember them at dinner and her saying, you really should do communications. You really should do communications. Mm. And I really just didn't know why but I was feeling maybe defeated or felt unsupported. And, and this is no fault of anybody's, right? This is all internal emotions of a 17-year-old, okay. 18-year-old girl. Yes. And um, so I, I changed my major. So started as a dance major, attained two communications. I think at one point I was PE. At one point I was political science pre-law. I thought I wanted to be a tax attorney for a while. I just was that student floundering around. Mm. Now, Lately, having worked with so many college students and having five kids ourselves between the ages of 19 and 24 right now, we've been through a lot of college searches and college behavioral things. And I see three types of students. I see those that they know what they're going to be. They know what they're going to do. They've known this for a long time. They're highly focused. And that's extraordinary. And I am behind them 100%. Then you see the ones that they think they know what they're going to do. And then they come to college and they learn about things they've never been exposed to yeah. and they change direction. Yes. And then we have the Jennifers of the world <laughs> that go, maybe can talk the game, but really are just sort of like, well, this is interesting and this is interesting and this is interesting. And the ADHD kicks in. <laughs> um, I think that at that time, at that moment, at 18 to 22, even to 35, it's very confusing, especially when you see peers that are highly focused. They know they're going down this accounting track. They have their five-year plan. They're executing that five-year plan. Should you have a five-year plan? Yes. If it doesn't go as planned, I think that's most of them. Yeah. That's <laughs> and that's okay. definitely me. I don't think I had a... a, a five-year plan at, at any point in my life. Um, what I did have was curiosity about a lot of different things. And that particular major at that particular junction, which was a, a small period of time, they had this major, it was called PCC. And it was half in the journalism school and half in the business school. Mm. And it let me explore a lot of different topics that other people were focusing on. And for me, that really worked out well. It was satisfying a lot of curiosity. How does that then translate into a job? If you recall, 
um, in 1991, we had a bit of a recession. So when I was graduating from college in 93, it was a pretty sluggish job market and nobody had a job except um, the accounting majors and the pharmacy majors. <laughs> pretty much the rest of us were trying to figure it out. And I had decent grades. I was in a leadership position in my sorority. I had won an award on campus by doing a, a sweeping overhaul of how um, the Greek system parties were run at that time. Um, some people didn't like me for that. <laughs> the administration really liked me for that. Um, so I won this alcohol awareness award and it was really just about mitigating some yeah. core behaviors that were that were associated with the Greek system that we really needed to have some sort of self-governance over before administration decided to govern us ourselves. And that was sort of my stance back then at age 20 years old, right? Awesome. Um, <laughs> so when I, I I had a great internship, I interned with the USA Gymnastics, where I worked in event planning and some public relations. I got to translate. I had taken nine years of French. I got to translate documents coming in from the International Gymnastics Federation nice. out of Africa. Um, and then I had the coveted, very difficult to get at that time, Disney internship in business management. Wow. Um, where at this point we need to, we need to put in perspective, this is before internet and email. Yes. This is, <laughs> <laughs> this is when you really had to have somebody who recognized something. And that was one of the few companies, Butler being a very small school compared to a Purdue university, yeah. there wasn't a lot of recruiting that went on on campus. Right. A lot of it were job postings that were literally on bulletin boards and you had to go and tear off contact information and write cover letters. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I happened, a gentleman on campus um, that I knew, but I wasn't close friends with, he had approached me and said, hey, I did this internship last summer, and I think that that you'd be a really great candidate for it. They're coming to campus, and I would like to recommend you. And it was like, wow, what is this about? And it was, a for a butler, it was a huge turnout of interviews, but I was very fortunate, and this is a lesson too, to be prepped by somebody who had a little inside knowledge. Yeah. I was told how to dress appropriately for Disney, which was not red lipstick, no eyeliner, no nail polish, neutral colored hose, blue skirt. I mean, it was very, very girl next door. Yeah. Um, and, and who would be interviewing me and sort of what the experience was like. So I have a little bit of knowledge, which now is open to everybody interviewing for a job or an internship on the internet. There's zero excuse not to be overly prepared for that particular yes. interview. So that happened to be a really good experience for me. It opened up a couple of interview opportunities during my senior year of college, but ultimately there weren't a lot of jobs. And I ended up working for, I went back to Disney for a while, and then I thought I want to be in sports and entertainment. This kind of goes together. Indy is such a sports city, right? Yeah. We had had the Pan Am games, um, the Colts had moved to town, I had worked um Briefly at the track when I graduated for the Holman family, which was great fun. I had two drivers I took care of, Paul Tracy and Alan Sir Jr. And my job was to make them breakfast every day. Oh, wow. That's yeah. awesome. Isn't that like crazy? Um, so that was like a three-week job. <laughs> I, and then I went back to Disney for a while. And then um, I came back and I worked on um, a friend of my parents um, connected me with somebody and I ended up working on a committee with Nancy Ursay to plan the Colts 10th anniversary celebration. Now, keep in mind, Tommy, and everybody listening, I've not been paid for any of these jobs yet. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> except for working at Disney yes. for $5.35 an hour Jeez. as a, as a tour guide. Oh, right? wow. Yes. So minimum wage job I had to not just interview for, but then I had to audition for it separately once I was there during my internship. But once you kind of had it, you could kind of come and go as a seasonal cast member. Yep. So through that, I somehow ended up getting um, a job with the Indianapolis Ice just on game days. So at that time, that team was the farm team to the Chicago Blackhawks. Mm. And, and they had just come off winning the IHL. So the international hockey league championship. So they yes. were kind of big stuff at that point. I worked for that team for free for the entire season, waited tables at Applebee's 
and I worked in the kitchen two days a week. So I worked seven days a week, always two days a week. I worked in the kitchen because I got a free meal. So one job I'm getting paid, I don't know, 20, 30 bucks for working game nights, right? Trying to get my foot in the door. And then I'm waiting tables, trying to pay my apartment rent and my car insurance and to eat the frozen burritos, probably I was getting (laughs) for 99 cents, right? So, but I wasn't alone in the early nineties. There were a lot of my peers that were doing very similar things um, just until we could get that job. And we were willing to do anything it took. We were willing to work for free. We were willing to do two or three jobs, just trying to get your foot in the door for your $16,000 a year job, right? Um, At the end of the season, I didn't have a job offer. So I went back to Disney again. Um, So I had, I was there three times on and off over two or three years. It's hard to tell back then. Now I can't remember all the dates exactly. Yeah. Um, It's probably on my LinkedIn. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I, then I got a phone call and they hired me full time. So I came back to Indianapolis and I worked for the hockey team and um, we moved to Market Square Arena at the time. And we were out there game nights. I'm walking in the hallways next to Reggie Miller and the nice. Indiana Pacers for a 22, 23 year old, 24 year old kid. And that was, that was pretty cool stuff, right? Nice. Yeah. I've been around movie stars. Now I'm being around, now I'm around all these pro athletes. Feels really cool. Um, and they did a reorg and I lost my job. And mm. I think whether you're fired, um, laid off, I did get fired, um, laid off, furloughed, downsized, reorged out, whatever it is. I think everybody needs to go through that at least once in life because it's such a gut punch. It is, it is the bottom floor of your career and what you do the next day will define how you move forward with resilience, the rest of your career, and frankly, in some of your personal life as well. So wasn't fun. I really hated it. Not a cool thing. Um, The next day, what I did is I got up and I walked down the street to what at that time was Manpower International. And they had a couple divisions. They had a temporary agency. And that's where I went because I'm like, I got to get money in the door. So I'm going to go do whatever it is for $8 an hour until I can get a a new career path, right? A new start. Um, And I remember the manager saying, she goes, yeah, this probably isn't for you, but we have a permanent position. Um, So I was hired by Manpower International, which is a Fortune 500 company. Oh. Uh And I ended up being a software trainer, a Microsoft trainer at Eli Lilly. Oh, cool. Right. So massive company. And of course, growing up in Indianapolis, this is like, woo, the pinnacle of things. Yes. And how that came about is because Eli Lilly was moving from a Mac OS to a Windows OS globally at that time. Mm. And I was randomly happened to be one of the people that I knew both platforms And I knew both platforms because I had this really quirky short-lived major at Butler University that was half in the business department using a PC and half in the journalism department using a Mac. And of course, Tommy, if you recall, you had to sign up for hours in the computer lab and walk across campus at 2 a.m. for your 30-minute slot to type your paper. Uh (laughs) Nobody had a a computer in their room or laptop. Laptop. You had to go to the lab. You had to go. You have to go to the computer lab, right? This is back when Michael Douglas was in Wall Street and there's the (laughs) scene on the beach and he has a cell phone that's like the size of my laptop now. (laughs) Right. 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 So nobody had a laptop except maybe IBM and they were like this big. Um, That's right. So I was I was out there for a little bit and um bored out of my mind. I mean, Mm. it was just very boring. I did get to do some fun stuff though. I got to work a help desk when I wasn't training. And this is um, before you could use the internet to Google the answer. So you had to recreate the problem and just know so many of the problems you've fixed in your head that are recurring. And nine times out of 10, it was the power switch or something wasn't plugged in. (laughs) Life was was simpler back then. 
so funny. Right. But so, this was this was at Manpower or it was, this was Lily. So Lily, yeah. So okay. I was employed by Manpower and contracted by Lily. By Lily, gotcha. Yeah, but I gotcha. was a permanent employee of Manpower in what was called Manpower Training, and it was okay. a division of what we know as Manpower International. Okay. Um, at that time. Okay. And it was it was very cool though. So on the life science side, um, reloxifene, which is called Invista or Evist Evista, which was an osteoporosis drug, got its FDA approval while I was there. And I set my cubicle was in the area where they were. And that was the most amazing celebration to see these scientists that had worked for years before I was yes. there, you know, doing things that I currently couldn't comprehend at all get an FDA approval for a drug that potentially down the road would be important to me as a, as a woman for osteoporosis. It was really neat. And also, and this is going to sound naive to a lot of Purdue students on, on my side is I didn't really realize there was like the drug reloxifene would be the same as the brand it's marketed as right. the same thing. Right. So yeah. I really learned a lot as a young person and to be exposed at this point now to three fortune 500 companies. So now I had worked inside um, the Disney company. Mm -hmm. I had worked inside manpower mm -hmm. and I had worked inside and went through an ISO 9,000 certification with them. Cool. Um, so had that experience and worked inside Eli Lilly where I was training everybody from an executive assistant to these PhD MD scientists yes. that were just having lunch with me. And I am mind blown by the information that I only understand part of because it's not a realm I've been in, but yet they're seeking my help on something they don't know. So a lot of this um, managing up, mm -hmm. managing down, um, writing manuals, I actually have a manual I kept and, and I, I should have brought it to this because you would laugh. I show it on, on, on conferences sometimes because it's yeah. literally typed up on a computer and printed out. And it says an introduction to the World Wide web for Eli Lilly and company by <laughs> Jennifer Merrill. Awesome. How awesome is that? <laughs> what a, you're such a pioneer. <laughs> I, I don't know, but yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of funny. Totally. So, um, in the same hood, there were several HR people. Oh, yeah, I got to witness layoffs at a Fortune 500 company in a way that, um, you know, it did definitely a couple things really shaped me. Um, one, Disney. I'm forever perpetually disappointed by service and and people's performance and their unwillingness just to go one little extra step. Just just one more thing, and that puts you ahead of everybody else. It's not that hard. Yes. Um, two that in corporate America, it's not personal when you lose your job. Mm. Yeah, It's not personal. Here's a list. We've got to cut a budget. Here are names attached to dollars. And we're crossing them off because I saw pink slips come out in envelopes. Mm. And that kind of thing is, is really hard. So by the time all this happens, I befriend this HR recruiter. I said, I'm not really thrilled with this. She has a couple things she has in the works at these real estate companies, these commercial real estate companies. I'm like, hey, never done that. That sounds interesting. Sounds fun. Let's try it out. And um, started going on interviews and ended up being hired by a company called Summit Realty Group. And it was started originally by three, but there were six partners at that time, about 10 people in the company mm -hmm. who had come from leading other commercial real estate firms. And they hired me as the manager of information service. And through this interview process, which by the way, there were five interviews. And at the fifth interview, I was like, do I even want to be here? If you don't know if you want to hire me yet. Right. How many people? <laughs> yeah. how and the fit, last gentleman. Fit, yeah. and so, so I got to go back though. So when I was fired at the Indianapolis ice, the gentleman there I worked for, his name was Ray Compton. He became the vice president of the Colts. Mm. Fast forward, Lily, manpower slash Lily, and I'm yeah. interviewing the fifth interview. The gentleman comes in and he just peeks his head in and he says, I want you to know Ray Compton is a good friend of mine. And he told me it'd be the biggest mistake in my career if I don't hire you. <laughs> wow. What? <laughs> right? 
That gentleman's name is Peter Quinn, and he was a calling common color commentator for per, Purdue football and in the Purdue Football Hall of Fame for many, many years. And I adore Peter to this day. His kids ended up babysitting for my kids. <laughs> and that company is what is now Collier's International and has over 200 employees. Wow. Um, but I went in there and I had to daisy chain the printers the first day through the ceiling because they weren't even sharing printers. And I kind of thought all this stuff was ready to go. And it wasn't. So I got to assist in installing the first network. I became a network administrator. I um, helped create the website, administrated the website, learned HTML, um, started doing email marketing before Exact Target or Salesforce even existed, where I was just kind of creating things very rudimentary in Outlook. Yeah. There were no systems. There was no software as a service. There was nothing. I mean, you right. could buy like... I remember buying ACT for a first CRM yes. and everybody bringing me their Palm Pilots when things wouldn't work. And I would just deconstruct those, literally yeah. took computers apart, rebuilt computers. I'd sit there on the floor in my office, like taking things apart and fixing them. And this is so not the dance major. No, so not the dance major. And so like, really, like you took a really hands-on approach, it sounds like. Well, I think what I learned and what has carried me through and what advice I would give any young person out there is not to be afraid and to go out there and be curious and grab as many skills as you can. Yeah. Don't be afraid to learn it. And now with the internet, all of this tech information, Tommy, you can go learn Python. My oldest son is a proud Purdue graduate. He is nice. a Boilermaker. And I'm, yeah. I'm happy to share that story because that's a really cool story, how his career has kind of developed over time too. But I remember going up to visit him one weekend and he was in his room at what was Purdue Village, Peeville at the time, which is <laughs> not there anymore. Peeville, right. That's where he lived his freshman year. Oh, crazy. And I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> and he said, I'm learning Python so I can run Bill's data faster. <laughs> He had started, I had mentored at Start Startup Weekend at Notre Dame. Yes. And a gentleman there, and it was total imposter syndrome because I'm like, hey, I got a bachelor's degree from Butler and I'm mentoring in your EMBA program. <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> <laughs> right. But okay, they're like, hey, we want you here. You're here because we ask you here. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this gentleman, um, he had a startup and and um he was on staff, he was high up staff there at Notre Dame. He said, Can I take you to dinner and kind of tap your brain for a few things. And I said, yes. And of course we exchanged some familial pleasantries, your family, my family, where'd you grow up? That kind of thing. Sure. And he said, would your son be interested? I've got a bunch of data. I don't have anybody. It's just me right now. Would he be interested in trying to, to analyze some of this? I said, I don't know. I'll ask him. He's a senior in high school. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And uh, he said, yeah, he just said, try it. I don't know yeah. what I'm doing. Right. So what what he was doing then a year later was learning Python so he could run this data faster. And cool. the data ended up, his analysis ended up winning them a contract with the city of South Bend. Oh, and at nice. this time, this kid's 18 years old. That's great. That's fantastic. That's and really, really good. Studying astrophysics at Purdue. <laughs> That's crazy. Not data science. Jennifer, I wanted to ask you though, if you could take us back Think about that, like, what did that injury do to change your mindset? Mm. I know athletes have a very strong work ethic, and it sounds like your injury didn't take that away from you. It's almost like you had built the work ethic wanting to be a dancer, but yet you realize now, okay, I'm injured. If I don't have a healthy body, there is no dancing, at least not at the level that you wanted to do. Tell us a little bit about what is what did that do to shift your mind? And it sounds like it was fairly early, right? You were pretty young still. So pivoting from that wasn't a huge ordeal. Uh, other, you know, it's not like you were already a professional dancer by then. Well, I would say that um, in my mind, I haven't pivoted yet. <laughs> <laughs> I really um, love that. I love that. I think that's so great. The work ethic is real. Um, so how we grew up at um, JCAD was um, 
black leotards, pink tights. There's no dance contests or competitions or that kind of thing you see on TV at all. Mm -hmm. If the door was shut and you were late, you didn't go in. Mm -hmm. You didn't talk and dance. Um, one teacher I had didn't even use um, a pianist. She had a cane. Just she tapped tapping, the rhythm. No right. way. And so we did this um, anywhere from um, three hours to four hours a day. Uh, most days, not Fridays, but most of the day Saturday. And, and mainly ballet, classical ballet, or also yeah. other types of... Other types too, but yeah. ballet is the foundation of all dance. Gotcha. Um, so having a strong classical ballet background. So I would say I probably was in tap maybe two to three hours. I usually had to demonstrate a class, um, sometimes teach a class when I was older. Um, ballet, mm, 10, 12, 15 hours a week. Um, and that would include a uh, variations class, which is partnering class. Mm -hmm. And that would include, uh, include technique point technique class. So we would have class that was just, um, very technical point work. Um, a lot of very, what people would consider very boring. So not choreographed per se, but just very technical mm -hmm. work. And then I would have jazz a couple times a week, um, which those were more fun for me because I enjoyed musical theater and, and that kind of thing. And really yeah. at five foot five, 110 pounds, I really didn't have the super long legged Balanchine body. I was yes. definitely a little more athletic. Yes. Um, but that discipline, because you couldn't talk, because you couldn't be late, because you had to adhere to a strict dress code, because it was very um, regulated, stuff and, and some of it was the same every day it creates a very disciplined behavior which i think did carry on into being a little bit too hard driving at work i tend to want to work myself to death at times i'm trying really hard really really hard this last year not to um but i'm i'm always like all in so i go all in and run too hard probably face burnout partially of personality disorder, partially because of some of the assignments I'll take, um, which are not good behaviors. <laughs> yes. But the good part of, of it is, is in dance. I mean, even when I got hurt, I went back and danced again. Yeah. I mean, I did, I did go back and dance again. I did take yeah. dance class at Butler. Um, but I don't know that I was ready to give it up. I think I felt very defeated um, it was very, I will say something was a little difficult. Um, uh, my sister, she ended up being the principal ballerina with Miami city ballet, which is a top company in the world, probably top 10, top five company in the world. And, um, they did the opening of the Olympics in Atlanta mm -hmm. and my mom and I went down and it was, um, very difficult to watch her dance still years later, we're talking years this is probably five years, six years after I quit. Yeah. Very difficult to watch her dance. And even more so when we were taking a walk and she said, you know, you would have made it. Mm -hmm. So that kind of sticks with you. And yes. it probably took me, uh, it probably took me another five years before yes. I enjoyed watching her dance. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so finally, probably in the early 2000s, I went, um, down to Miami and um, to the Jackie Gleason Theater and took my very young children at the time. And I finally really enjoyed watching her dance. So it may have been some jealousy, yes. but also probably disappointment in myself. Yeah. Because again, I had another opportunity to go back and do it again when I was in college. I had two friends at Point Park. I got a phone call, no audition needed just because of them and my background we will take you in our program at Point Park. Mm. Both those girls became Rockettes. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. How interesting. And um, to, to say I turned that down, I, yeah. I turned that down. Yeah. You know, so I clearly was making a decision for a reason. Mm -hmm. So that disappointment was disappointment in myself. 
Yeah. I, so, like, but the what if, right. The, the, you know, they, people always say, don't you try not to live with any regrets. And so maybe that's, that's what keeps weighing down. Was it a regret? Is it a regret or not a regret? Um, but you've done so much with your life. And I think the impulse that you got from just that turning point uh, the trajectory change and sure, you know, you're going to think about it very much every once in a while in your life and you're going to be reflecting on what if it would have been. But also what I see is that you're not satisfied with just like, okay, just this one thing here, we got to keep going. And that Every step of the way, if you keep getting down, it's almost like that's motivation to like get yourself back up and we're going to go do the next thing and we're going to go pick up that next challenge and we're going to learn something new. We're going to interact with a new new set of people, new community, new adventures. It's almost like, you know, like your story is a lesson for all of us to really listen to and really appreciate, right? And that, my gosh, e e even if you get fired from your favorite job and you had, you know, great relations with the people and so on, you just woke up and here was your next adventure at Manpower Eli Lilly and learning learn even going back to what you had already experienced and, and taking it and probably learning even further the differences between a Mac operating system and a Windows operating system. It's so awesome. Uh, so, but, you know, like there is, there, there are nuances in your story also that reflect on uh, your character, and I, if, at least from from the bit that you've told us, your character was formed fairly early on as an independent uh, type. Like you weren't really going to rely on anybody else <laughs> to make your way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, uh, I, I don't know if I got that from somewhere or if it's just how I am. Mm. Um, my dad was a military officer. Uh, -huh. uh, so I would say our house was very conservative growing up and very disciplined yes. growing up. Yes. Um, and I didn't ever really rebel against that. I think that I leaned in and I do well within discipline. Now I am very self-disciplined. I don't really care for other people disciplining me. <laughs> And I do better when there are fewer rules because I have a lot of self-imposed rules. And I do think some of those self-imposed rules are for sure from my upbringing, mm. but not better or worse. But my dad always was, you know, pick yourself up, go do it. He was a little bit, some people would say tough love or uh, stoic in some mm -hmm. ways. Um, I don't think that my sister and I are stoic, but we definitely are both very self-disciplined and dance probably amplified what yeah. sort of that home life of discipline was. We were very much expected, you know, work before play, mm -hmm. uh, school work before this. Um, and we, I did that yes. now college. Tommy, I'm not going to say I was perfect in college. I certainly made plenty of mistakes. <laughs> I certainly went to plenty of parties. I certainly had plenty of classes I skipped in moments where I didn't do well on a test. Um, could I have done a lot better? Yes. I think that that was probably my moment of freedom. Yes. Um, and also that moment of confusion. Like I thought I would do this and now I'm not doing this and I'm not sure yeah. what to do with my life. And I will tell you now, um, my 53rd birthday is next week. And Ooh, I still don't know what birth. I want to be when I grow up. Yeah, happy <laughs> birthday. <laughs> well, and I think yeah. that it's okay. It's okay yeah. that you don't know. And this um, illusion that everybody at 17, 18, 20 yes. years old knows this is what I'm going to be yeah. for my life. And being is a job title. I don't think that that is reality for most folks. 
And I think a lot of us um, have a lot of curiosity and yeah. maybe your curiosity is focused solely in the, the realm of life science or realm of tech yes. or realm of sports. And that's all good. Or maybe you are a little bit more like me and your curiosity has brought you to several different industries, which maybe hasn't made me rich by any means, right. but it certainly is feeding my brain. Yeah, <laughs> and it's for sure. feeding me with, it, it's satisfying this curiosity of, I wonder what that's like. Yeah, Let's yeah. go try that out. Yeah. So being injured or changing, you know, or, or being fired or having anything that derails what you think is the path that you're on is really just an opportunity to allow yourself to be curious yep. about what else is there. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much out there and maybe that's part of the confusion too, because you have so many choices that it's hard to elect uh, select which choice you want for yourself, right? We're mm -hmm. like, what do I want to spend my time? And most of us, I think, throw away our time, right? Like we watch way too much TV and, <laughs> but we, you know, surf too much online and social media and all this stuff. It, it's a it's a big waste of time if we could use the time appropriately. But so I, you know, I agree with you so much in that. They're no, no, the majority of the people are like how you and I are like, we're still figuring out what we want to be when we grow up. Um, the, and, 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 you know, I've been fairly directed, but, you know, I first started with plants. Now I'm more into biomedical immunology, all this stuff. It, it, it's almost like, Oh, opportunities that open up. I'm, I'm going to go chase. And as you said, Let's go explore because there's so much to discover, so many new things. Mm -hmm. And it's not like you 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 see them. There's like one in 100 kids that say, no, I want to be a doctor. And I'm all, like, that's the career path. And that's what they did all their lives. Uh, for some of us, we had too, maybe too many choices. Oh, I wanted to be whatever <laughs> in different days. I, I do think, though, that... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like so many different, oh, whatever is the T-shirt of the day that I can wear, that's what I will be. But I think you you even alluded to this, is that we kind of tend to think that, oh, this is forever. I got to pick this and it's got to be what I am going to identify with. Um, and it just seems kind of crazy. Yeah. Uh, that at such a young age, we're going to need to pick that identity and also that to think that, oh, this is for the rest of my life type of thing. No, nothing is forever except death and taxes. We know this. <laughs> I, mean, I love that. Right? That's, that's, that's right. That's a common phrase. Yes. I, I like to tell students um, when I've been in, in uh, lecture halls and stuff that remember your job you're dating your job. Yes. You're not, you're not marrying your job. That's right. Even if yeah. you're an entrepreneur and you start your own company and you grow this company, you can just date it. Yes. You yes. don't have to, you don't right. have to marry it. Now I will say though, you should have some sort of plan just like on a whim, quitting a job and on a whim doing this. Those are not necessarily good plans because right. you do have to financially be able to support yourself. Sure. So having some sort of plan is good where, where my plan really wasn't a plan, but sort of was, is there's a common thread that runs throughout almost all of the opportunities or doors that have opened for me. And it's that I've added these tech skills on to other perceived skills or roles that I've yeah. had. Yeah. And that particular skill set. It, frankly, I think still is applicable to every single industry and every single job yeah. is layer on these pieces that make you valuable Yeah, because everybody needs them because everybody doesn't have them. Especially when you start looking at small and medium sized businesses, mm -hmm. they love people who can maybe fulfill a full, a few different roles for them, right? Yeah. They don't need a full-time graphic designer or web designer. But if you've got these tech skills, you can package in on top of 
Maybe you're a great writer. Maybe you are a great salesperson, but they need right. you to be able to administrate the back end of Salesforce for your team. Right. I don't know what it could be, but sure. th that thread actually, I believe now looking back, that thread is what allowed me to jump industries more smoothly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and um, talking, talking about uh, technology, tell us a little bit about your time at TechPoint. What was it like to build that thing? Um, I, I, we've had, uh, we've had Brian Stemmy on the program and I know he was up there also with Agronovus and all of what was, you know, bio crossroads and so on. Tell us a little bit about how, like, what was it like at tech point at its infancy? And you had, you had this. VP, but was it mainly communications? Tell, tell us about what, what that was like. Sure. Well, the infancy of TechPoint actually goes way back over 20 years um, before they were even under the Central Indiana Corporate Partnership. So quite a long um, ways back. Um, and I couldn't even adequately tell you the right history of it. Um, but uh there have been maybe three or four different CEOs now. Um, I was there with Mike Langelier, and um, I would say it was nothing short of pretty much magical, very hard, long hustle and grind um, at, at the speed of light type things. But uh, Mike's leadership was uh, truly visionary in the sense that uh, one, one great example. So there's a program called Extern. It is one of the largest, most sought off after tech internship programs in the country, and TechPoint happens to run it. I think it's in maybe year 12 or 13. In 2020, we all recall everybody had to go home in March, right, for COVID. We had somewhere between 180 to 200 interns that were getting ready to start at the end of May throughout central Indiana. We house them, do professional development, and then, of course, their, their nine-to-five job with their corporate employers. And that all went away overnight. Employers pulled out. Housing is gone. How do we do programming? I don't know how many we had left, maybe maybe 30 or 40 that, that were remote jobs that we got to keep, and um, everybody went home. And Mike looked at us and we sat there sort of defeated, like on a Zoom call, right? <laughs> we can't let this happen. These, yeah. these kids, they need experience. They need money. They need connections. What are we going to do? And he looked at us and this is middle April. We've got three, four weeks, maybe three, because these students, we've got to find them something or we also lose them. And yeah. we're trying to get him to love Indiana and stay here, right? Yes. Um, and he said, well, let's let's find them jobs. Let's figure out what to do. And we're like, well, let's create a job for them. Let's go get some money. Let's go find a grant money. We got Lily, I think, gave us some money. Um, and we created, okay, if you finish a, like a boot camp project with us, you will get a, a $500 stipend. So you get some money. We're going to get you coaches. It's going to be online. So everybody's got a mentor and we're going to put you in teams. So we created a program in three weeks oh that gosh. had three business students and three tech students on each team. And then we got subject matter experts to come up with problems and kind of coach the problem. And there were maybe 12. So we had 12 different industries. So like one was sports, one was life science. There were industries around Indiana. Yeah. What's the problem we have because of COVID? How do we solve it? And then each team had a coach and I ended up coaching a sports tech team. Nice. Um, so those kids got all of the things they needed. Then Mike looked at us and he said, if we can do this for 50 kids, we can do it for 500 kids <laughs> in three weeks. Oh boy. And this team at tech point, my, my team I was on. And at the time there were three of us, we recruited 200 coaches in three weeks. Jeez. That is very typical of a month period of time at TechPoint. What can we do 
that is the biggest thing you can possibly think of. And if we can do that, why can't we do it even bigger Yeah. or for more people? Yeah. Or can we raise more money? Can we get more clients? You know, um, when I was there, um, I was able to convert Google, AWS, Twilio. Let's bring some big names to the table. Um, Mike Langelier, Lauren Peterson worked for, I think, probably a good year on a giant Microsoft grant that TechPoint's still utilizing today that has to do with talent development. Um, so we we made we made magic. Nice. And we did it through people who had an unwavering belief that we could do whatever, no matter what it takes. Yeah. And the people were dedicated to doing whatever it takes. We're going to figure out how to get this. And we worked together. We collaborated. There was so much teamwork. Um, and it was That's just, awesome. we had leadership and we had group of people working there that believed we could change the world. Sounds like a wonderful, wonderful environment, wonderful place. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my role, my role was, um, we had, uh, my role was uh, vice president of engagement and that really is a consultative sales role. Okay. So the, we had um, a little over a hundred member organizations at the time mm -hmm. and the team I had, and when I left, we had four people. The team I had, we recruited those members. So we sold them on being a part of TechPoint. So sold them not only on the mission and the vision, but also why they wanted to be, why they wanted to be a part of it and interacting with these other companies. And what we were trying to do is to put small startups, um, well, fast growth, they were scaling up. So not, not brand new, like beginning, but scaling up with the medium companies, the big companies, the Lilly's Cummins, Roche, sure. Rolls Royce, right? Raytheon, and then um, higher ed. Can we put them in rooms together where we can try and solve some of Indiana's biggest problems when it comes to talent attraction and the growth and development of the tech digital economy in the state of Indiana? I, so I, our team would go out and recruit those. And then we did some consultative type work so yeah. that our job was revenue. And I, it's one of the reasons why I was intrigued to talk to you and get you on Pathfinder, because I have the, a similar motive in the life sciences, trying to put people from Purdue together with companies and get companies to come and work with us through the Indiana CTSI, which is with Indiana University and the University of Notre Dame as well as Purdue. And, you know, there's there's so much opportunity if we start to uh, go deeper and, and work further together. You spoke about a little bit of, about it was magic. Tell us a little bit about what what magic needs to happen for these collaborations to be uh, fruitful, to be productive, to be long lasting? Yeah. So when we're talking, and can I, am I assuming, Tommy, you're freezing up a little bit on me here, but yeah, not can really I sure. assume we're talking about when we, when we put industry and in, industry. Yes. And are academia. we kind of talking about when we take industry and academia together? Yes. Yeah. I think some of that magic really has to, to, to run into a couple of realms. Cause I've, I've done some introductions between academia and industry that did not go well. And some that did go well. Mm. And a lot of that has to do with making sure that you're bringing the right people with the right mindset to the table. So if one or the other is very, let's say selfishly inclined and that's their purpose, it's probably not going to work out. It really does need to be a true collaboration and understanding that we're looking to create wins across the board. Right. We want to create wins for the industry partner. Mm -hmm. We want to create wins for the academic partner. And I also want to create wins for any student 
involved, right? Mm-hmm. So they need to have an, an an experience that is positive and meaningful to their future career path. Right. So on the industry side and the academic side, it's most important whomever is facilitating this collaboration from the get-go understands what their motives are. What are their priorities? What is their why? Always start, Simon Sinek says that, always start with the why. Yes. But it is, why do you want to talk and partner with academia? Why do you want to talk and partner with industry? Yes. We can make some presumptions, but we don't know until we really ask. And then we make sure everybody has has whys that create the the, the cohesive wins, Yeah. right? Yeah. So if industry is just there, well, I just need them to do a project. Well, then we need to set you up with the right part of the academic institution that's just going to execute this prototype or whatever you need. Mm-hmm. And that's very, very transactional. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. That's a sure. that's a good thing. It, it's it is still a win win. If we want to collaborate on something that's more long term, let's think like the long term collaborations happening in the data mine. Mm. That's a good one at Purdue. Sure, uh, it's one of my favorite ones um, because industry partners um, not only are looking for work to be done, analytics to be done, data to be analyzed for their specific project. They are also bought into the mission of why it's important for these students to have this experience and working with the institution, working with the TAs, working with the executive directors to create the educational opportunity. So we've got mission alignment also. And I think that that's a really important piece is that if it's not mission oriented, that's fine, but make sure we align it with the right part of the institution Mm-hmm. That that's getting getting things together. Otherwise, you're going to kind of get into some ickiness down the road. Yeah. So it's it's really understanding the why from the get go. Words of wisdom, and it sounds like words of a lot of experience there too. Jennifer Morell, thank you so much for taking time to speak to me today. Uh, thank you for letting us peer into your uncharted uh, journey and uh, your your life so far, uh, telling us so many wonderful tidbits about, about your, you know, your formation, about Indiana, Indianapolis. It was just wonderful talking to you today. Thank you so much, Tommy. And we will grab a game of golf then. Absolutely. Absolutely. I hope, I hope you'll have some patience with me for sure. Well, if you saw my game earlier this week, it won't be a problem because I scored a 120. Okay. So we're good. <laughs> All right. I'll bring <laughs> extra balls. <laughs> that's that's going to be needed. <laughs> well, thank you, Jennifer. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Tommy. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us once again, and remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel.